Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to Colossians chapter 3 this morning. As uh, This is the last week in our series called Things Above. And uh, over the last few weeks, we've looked at Colossians chapter 3, and the challenge has been for us as Christians, the commandment has been for us as Christians to set our mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, not on earthly things. And today we're going to jump in in uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 16. We're going to read verse 16 and 17 in just a few moments. As we do, the other day I was looking through uh, an old book of mine, and uh, I, I don't even remember what the book was, but I'm flipping through, and out falls a little index card, and on the card is the name Velissa Danielle Deskins. It was kind of all uh, done up well and, and, you know, kind of artistic, but out fell the card, Velissa Danielle Deskins. I think on the other side was a Bible verse or something like that, but it really was a throwback, Right? Um, Valissa and I have been married just over eight years. Uh, We're starting to plan for our 10-year anniversary trip. I'm looking forward to that. I think we're going to go to Alaska. Uh, But when I think about Valissa Danielle Deskins, it's been a long time since I have called her by that name. And uh, and I realized something when it comes to uh, a difference between girls and guys. Me as a guy, I have never once thought or wondered what my name will one day be. I was born Timothy Martin Howe. I'm going to die Timothy Martin Howe. It's the name my parents gave me, and, uh, and it's not going to change. But for young girls, and I, I see some smiles around from the ladies, because you know that really fairly early on, there is an awareness that your name may not stay the same for your entire life. And, uh, and for some, that is a huge blessing. Like, uh, you know, you're looking forward to that and you're thinking, oh, what's my name going to be? And you, you start to think about a guy that you have a crush on and then what do you do? Start to think about what your name would be, right? And uh, this happens, right? We know it happens. That's okay. But it's so interesting because names really are important. You, you've heard Shakespeare, right? A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. That's kind of a, a, a pithy way to say, do names really matter? But they do. And biblically speaking, names are incredibly important. And we know this because at times God uh, erupts into history and He says, name this person this name. He did that with His own son, with Jesus. He said to Mary and Joseph, name the child Jesus because He will bring salvation to His people. He will save His people from His sins. The word for Jesus is salvation. And and when it comes to names, uh, for, for ladies, your name can change. And what does that represent? It represents something new that's been formed. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, a man shall leave his father and his mother and the two shall become one flesh. A new unit is produced. And when you change your name, it's because you have literally changed your identity. And I can tell you this as a dad, that breaks my heart. It really does. I don't really like the idea that my daughter's names will change, but they will if they get married. When it comes to names in the Bible, there is no greater name than the name of Jesus the holy name of Jesus, the name above all names. And this morning, we're going to read these two verses where Paul wants to ground our Christian witness. He wants to ground our Christian identity in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, here's what it says in verse 17. I'm going to read it. This is a principle that Paul gives. He says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, we're going to dive into that a little deeper here in a few minutes, but I just want to to put that out to you up front, that Paul says that as Christians, we are called to live in accordance with the name that has been given to us. We have been adopted into the family of God. We have been called by the name of Jesus. And therefore, Paul says, the name of Jesus our representation of Jesus, the fact that we are ambassadors of Jesus, that should change everything we do in word and in deed. Now, when it comes to the name, I'm thankful. I don't believe that Velissa is ashamed to share my name. But can I turn that coin on the other side a little bit and just tell you this morning, it is one of the greatest truths in all of Scripture that Jesus is not ashamed for us to be called by His name. Jesus is not ashamed for us to represent His name to the world. And as I think about myself, and as I think about my sinfulness and unworthiness, it is a humbling reality that the name above all names is a name that Jesus says, I am called to represent in the world. 
And the question then is, how do we do it? How do we represent that name in a way that honors and pleases the Lord? Paul says at the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, set your mind on things above. That's first. That's primary. Set your mind on Jesus, not on earthly things. And we're going to continue in this vein of thought. We're going to jump in in verse 16 where Paul has some incredibly practical advice on how to do that. He says in verse 16, I invite you to read it with me, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I, and I want to pause right there and unpack this a little bit. Paul says something very interesting. And did you notice the way that he said it? Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. Now, there are two ways that this can be done. In a personal way where the word of Christ dwells in me personally, but also in a corporate way. We're going to look at those in a second, but think about the language of dwelling. In fact, this this verb that says, let the word of Christ dwell in you, is just a verbal form of the noun house or home. In other words, let the word of Christ, let the message of Christ, who Christ is, what Christ has done, how Christ has come to save and redeem you and give you new life, let that word dwell in you and make its home in you. And we've talked about this previously, right? That the idea of being saved isn't just that my sins have been washed away. It's the idea that Christ now takes residence in my life so that in every area of my life, financially, relationally, with my family, with my job, in every area, Christ is to be on the throne. This is what it means to let the word of Christ, who Christ is and what he's done, dwell in you. For it to be home in you more and more and more in our lives. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, I said there's both a personal element to this and a corporate element to this. Here's what I mean. As Christians, we are called to let the Word of Christ dwell in us individually so that it transforms the way we think, the way we behave, our mind and our heart. But it's not just something that's meant to to stay within us. The Bible says that among you, plural, the word of Christ is to dwell. In other words, it's not just, oh, look at this person. They're a great person who follows Jesus. It's look at this body of believers. Look at this group of people who do not look like the world, but love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, and at times, even when it's hard to admonish one another, look at what it says, that that's what we are called to do with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, I I want you to think about this for a moment. What would it mean to encourage one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? And it says not just encourage, it says teaching and admonishing. Well, when it comes to songs, uh, scientists have known this for a long time, that songs are one of the best known ways to teach people. And here's why. Our brains are hardwired to remember songs. And you know this. Have you ever had a song that you can't get out of your head? Yes, probably. Maybe a Dawson Hollow tune, right? It just keeps on going, keeps on going. You can't get it out of your head, okay? It's, it, our brains are hardwired to remember music. So Christians have known this for a long time, and Jewish people before that, right? We can learn about God, and we can drill deep into our heart, deep into our conscience by using music to teach us the truth. And this is what I love. For me, I love When a song that I learned maybe when I was three, four, or five years old, I love when I sing a song and there's something new that arises out of it. Songs are some of the best teachers that we have. And listen, it's not just true individually, it's true corporately. For instance, the the other day, it was a a little over a week ago, we had a community-wide prayer service uh, over at Mercy Hospital. It was a great time. There were pastors from all kinds of different churches, Baptist churches, non-Baptist churches, non-denominational churches, Presbyterian churches, all these different churches. And I loved it. Because we got to pray together as one body of Christ, but we also got to sing. And you know the song that we sang together at the end? Amazing Grace. And just singing that song was a reminder. It was a teaching moment that we are all under the grace of God, that we need the grace of God. Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. We needed that teaching. We needed that encouragement. And Paul says that when it comes to the body of Christ, we do that through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, I want to say this up front. We we live in a time where, where people talk about worship wars. And I'm thankful that the so-called worship wars are over. You know what I'm thankful? Because I think they're ridiculous. I mean, I'm just going to lay that out up front. I don't care what kind of music you like. 
Some people say that hymns are better than, than contemporary worship songs. I think that's total nonsense. There are good hymns. There are bad hymns. There are good songs that are contemporary. There are bad songs that are contemporary. There are good songs musically. C.S. Lewis said it like this. He knew of some hymns that were fourth-rate lyrics matched to fifth-rate melodies. You've heard some. I have too. And it doesn't matter when they were written. It matters whether or not they're teaching us the truth. But I love songs that have bore deep into my heart. Songs that in my worst moments, they come, come forth. Songs like this, I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like Thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. And listen, I don't care if it's the hymnal version or the Chris Tomlin version. That song speaks to my soul. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell among you richly through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's why we gather. Have you ever wondered, why do we sing so much in church? That's why we do it. We do it to remind ourselves of who Christ is. We do it to shortcut all of the, the cerebral obstacles that sometimes are in place when we come distracted to church. We do it to cut to our heart, to remind ourselves of truth, and to give ourselves the fuel we need to go back into the world ready to face the fire. Psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. And notice this, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Um, I don't know about you, but I have an amazing ability. Have you ever noticed this? Have you ever been singing a song and you know that you've been singing, but you don't remember the last time you were paying attention to the words, right? I mean, this happens to me on Sunday morning. I'm going to be honest, right? Sunday morning, I do my best, but it is a battle for me sometimes to pay attention to what I'm singing. Why? Because my mind is on all kinds of other things. My mind is on what I'm going to preach. My mind is on the visitor I just talked to. Do I remember their name? Those kind of things. Those are running through my mind so I can be singing through an entire song and be singing. But the question is, is my heart engaged? Isn't there a difference between singing a song when your heart is engaged and singing a song when you're totally distracted? Some of the most powerful moments in my life spiritually have been moments where I've been worshiping Jesus with an undistracted heart. And I just want to encourage you this morning, we gather Sunday after Sunday singing praise to God because that praise has the power to transform. But let's keep going in verse 17. It says this, Paul saying, and whatever you do, so in your singing, in your worship, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Paul is saying here, don't just think about what you do on Sunday morning when you're gathered together at church. Think about every area of your life. Think about what you're going to do on Monday morning when you go in to the office. Think about what you're going to do on Monday when you come home to, to, to relax and maybe take in a game or, or take in a movie. Think about what you're going to do with your family. Think about what you're going to do uh, with your holiday. Think about all of it, whatever you do, word or deed. It could not be all more encompassing. He says, whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, one of Paul's favorite metaphors to explain what we are and who we are as Christians is the metaphor of ambassador. And an ambassador is this. An ambassador is someone who represents someone else in a foreign land. The idea is this, that this earth is not our home. The Bible says that we are strangers, we are sojourners, and we are ambassadors who are representing our true home and our true allegiance, which is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says we are ambassadors as though God is making his appeal to the world through us. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Paul is writing this from a Roman prison. He is writing this as a prisoner of the state. And yet, here's what Paul says. That even though he has been jailed for crimes against the state, his primary concern is that he would represent well the name of Jesus. Now, think about how strange this would have been. Imagine for a moment you're one of those Roman centurions, right? I mean, you're someone who has been tasked with 
taking care of Paul, making sure he doesn't escape, making sure he doesn't leave. That didn't always work out well, by the way, for Roman centurions. If you're watching Paul, for instance, the guy in Philippi, you better watch out because God's going to send an earthquake to get him out of jail. But listen, when it came to Paul, in this moment he was in prison, but he didn't lose sight of his primary allegiance to Jesus. But think of, think of how that story would have gone to the centurion. Well, Paul, you know, I'm the centurion who's in charge of you. It may last a while. You know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, I'm Paul. I serve a guy by the name of Jesus. He was homeless. He had uh, basically no money. He didn't have anywhere to lay down his head. His life ended in a bloody crucifixion, but I believe that he rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God. I mean, imagine that you're the centurion. Oh, Paul, that's very interesting. Note to self, get a psychologist in here. We need to do a full examination on this crazy man. But think about this. No, no, sir, you don't understand. The God that I serve is the king over all kings. He's the Lord over all lords. Uh, Paul, you do know that I'm a centurion. We're in Rome. Like, I work for Caesar, right? I, I work for the most powerful man in the universe. Oh, that's so funny. You really believe that? Like, you really think that Caesar runs the world? No, my God runs the world. Well, Paul, if your God runs the world, why are you in jail? Well, that's the way that my God runs the world. See, I'm his ambassador. Oh, sure you are. Sure you are, Paul. But as crazy as it seems, it was Paul's commitment to this idea that he was to represent the name of Jesus that actually began to turn the Roman world upside down. Think about it like this. Eventually, those centurions who worked for Caesar, who worked for the emperor, who worked for the king who had all power, eventually they began to see that maybe the one we serve really isn't in charge. Maybe the one who's really in charge is the God who sent Paul to this prison. Now, don't miss that. Don't miss the change. Because what happened was they had to quit looking at the world around them. In the world around them, they knew who had power. They had power. But there was something inside of them that recognized, no, no, this this man in prison has something that we don't have. He doesn't have riches, he doesn't have fame, but he has joy, he has peace, he has power in his life. There is something changed about this man that we cannot explain. And the very soldiers that were called to keep track of Paul were the same people that Paul won for Christ. So he says in the end of Philippians, greet those among us, greet those believers who are in Caesar's household. In other words, Paul says, we have come to turn the tables. Just as Jesus did in the temple, we are turning the tables on power. We are turning the tables on those who pretend to be in charge. Why? Because we serve the king who showed his strength by dying on a cross and then taking up his life again. And this, by the way, is why Paul, he looked at Christians and he says, don't forget that you are called to represent the name of Jesus. Don't be seduced by power. Don't be easily impressed. And and I want you to think about Paul for a moment. Paul was someone who drastically changed in that regard. Think about Paul's early life. Paul was a young Jewish man who was on a skyrocket. He had a meteoric kind of rise in terms of his career where he was there interning with the highest Jewish powers. They were known as the Sanhedrin. Paul was there working for those members of the Sanhedrin and well on the way himself. But in the moment when Paul was doing what it took for him to rise that ladder, he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus and I love it. It says that Jesus was shining so bright in his glory that the sun had to cover its eyes. And in that moment, something for Paul changed. All of a sudden, his desire to be influential and powerful became a desire that said, no matter what, even if I'm imprisoned, I will follow Jesus. And by the, by the way, this, this wasn't just something that changed in his mind. Think about how Paul treated people with power. Paul went before governors. Paul went before kings. Paul probably even went before the emperor himself. And you know what? Paul was never impressed. You, you can read this in the book of Acts. He went before Felix, who was the governor, and King Agrippa. And it says that they entered with all of their pomp and circumstance, these generals and officials, and they all came in, they all entered, and Paul came before them. And you know what Paul didn't do? He didn't say, oh my goodness, they're so powerful. 
Oh my goodness, the influence they yield. Oh my goodness, if the right person isn't on the throne every four years, the world's going to fall apart. No, you know what Paul did? He looked at them and he pleaded with them. Come to Jesus. He said to them, oh, that you would be as I am except for these chains. And this is something that is so important for Christians. Listen, Christians are not called to kowtow to the would-be powers of this world. We're not called to bow down seeking power and living, giving up our own moral credibility just to gain it. Christians are called to live in the name of Jesus. In other words, we are not supposed to be impressed with worldly rulers. We are not supposed to, to give our allegiance to earthly men. We have a king. We have a savior. We have a rock that, that at the end of the day, our world can be built on. And it's not anyone who's running for office. It's not anyone who's elected. It is Jesus. When Paul looked at kings and governors and emperors, you know what he said? I've seen better. You don't impress me. And listen, not only do you not impress me, you don't scare me either. Two things Christians should not be in terms of their relationship to men. They should never be impressed by men. And they should never be afraid of men. You know why? Because Paul, who at one time sought power and prestige and influence, Paul said, I have set my mind on things above. And when you see Jesus, all of a sudden, all of the other impressive things, all of the other, uh, all, all the other pretensions of power, they fade away. Paul could have looked at Caesar and said, can you raise the dead? Paul could have looked at Felix and said, did you die for my sins? Paul could have looked at King Agrippa and said, do you outshine the morning sun? Of course not. And yet for so many people, this was true in Paul's day, it's been true ever since. For so many Christians, we have been allured by earthly power. We put our hope in who is in office. And listen, I'm not saying politics doesn't matter, but don't put your hope in an election. Don't put your hope in any human, especially not a human, who openly defies the very laws that God has given us. Your hope will be misplaced. And the foundation that you have will be shown to be sand if that foundation is anyone other than Christ. Paul says, don't sell your soul. You're called by the name of Jesus. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about your life. You know, when it, when it comes to being an ambassador, I, I, I was in the band in high school. We've got some band people in here. I love you. You're my people, right? Okay. Here's the fun thing about band. When it comes to band, you had to wear a uniform. And when you weren't in a uniform, you were in a t-shirt. And when you weren't in a t-shirt, you were wearing a jacket that said Lebanon Bands. You were always kind of in that mode. And here's the thing about a, a band, right? Um, band is not exactly the, the most spectator-friendly thing to witness, right? If your kid's in the band, here's what you're doing. You're like, okay, where are they? Oh, yeah, uh, kind of like... In fact, the hope is this. The hope is that you blend in when it comes to a band, right? I mean, if you're on the football field, everyone knows who the quarterback is. I might not even know who my own child is at the halftime show, right? I'm just going to clap for him and say, yes, you did a good job. That's how it works in a band. Why? Because you are not supposed to uplift yourself. You're supposed to be a part of something greater, a part of something whole. And when you go and travel, you go all across Missouri or wherever you go to play in the band, you are representing your community. It's not about you. It's not about your accolades. It's not about what you're going to accomplish. It's about who you are and where you come from. Listen, the same thing is true when it comes to Christians called by the name of Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about representing someone who, listen to me, transcends nation, transcends the moment, transcends power. Why? Because he's the king above all kings. And he's the Lord above all lords. And his name is the name that is above all names. Can I challenge you and myself for a moment? Imagine that kind of like in a band where you wear a uniform, imagine that you had to live every day with a Christian uniform. All right, and imagine the Christian uniform was this, a t-shirt that said, I follow Jesus. Would that change the way that you live? I was talking to someone after the first service. They said, I've got a bunch of Jesus t-shirts. And listen, when I wear a Jesus t-shirt and I go in and I'm mad at someone, oh, I've got to bite my lip. 
would the words that you speak, would they be different if at all times you had a shirt that said, I love Jesus? Or would the way that you treat people change if at all times you had to wear something that said, I belong to Jesus? Of course, there's a silly analogy, but the reality is Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do in the name of Jesus. Do it knowing that you represent him. Doing it in such a way that points people beyond the hopes of this world. I see so many Christians who are putting their hopes in this world. Paul says it's better to die, to live as Christ and to die as gain, than it is to act like somehow our hope is in any man or woman other than Jesus. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Church, Christians are to be marked by hope and joy and life and peace. And in fact, the most common commandment in Scripture, you've heard it before, is this, don't be afraid. And there's no asterisk, don't be afraid, except for what might happen in an election. Don't be afraid, except what might happen with a pandemic. Don't be afraid, except, no, there's no asterisk. It's just don't be afraid. Why? Because you have been called by the name of Jesus. You belong to Him. And for so many Christians, I think we've, we've got to the point where instead of looking above, all we do is look around us. Listen. Paul was able to write these words because his heart was transformed when he set his mind on things above. And church, that's what we're called to do, is to set our mind over and over and over again, not on the things of this world. And listen, it's only then that we can engage this world rightly, but it will never happen unless we take the time to set our eyes on Jesus and let everything else grow strangely dim. I was reminded this week of a song. As I think about Jesus, I want it to be true of me that I would rather have Jesus than anything. You've heard the song, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold, I'd rather have him than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus. Than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Is that true of you? I pray it's true of me, and I pray each one of us will fix our eyes on Jesus because he is seated on a throne. And listen, he's not moving until he comes to bring us home. Let's pray.